Welcome back to season eight of Talking with Traders. This is the fourth year of this podcast since it began in 2020. Once again, IG Markets have come on board as the sponsor of this podcast. We're truly grateful and privileged to have such a global leader in CFD trading as our sponsors. In the coming weeks, I'll be interviewing various guests from around the globe on the topic of trading. Some of these will be past guests that we invite back onto the podcast, and some will be new guests. The idea is to attract a broad spectrum of different perspectives from players in different areas of the markets. None of what you hear here is financial advice, but it is intended to get you thinking about how you might be able to apply what you hear here to your own trading and investing. Remember to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. That way, you'll be notified when new episodes are released. Once again, thank you to IG Markets for sponsoring this podcast into its fourth year. And thank you listeners for your continued support of this podcast. Now let's get into this week's episode. Welcome back to another episode of Talking with Traders, and I'm delighted to bring a new guest to the podcast this week. He's a Forex trader. His name is Ian Coleman from FX Street Premium. Uh, He's an analyst there and a Forex trader. And we haven't had many Forex traders on this podcast, funnily enough. And and this is actually episode number 101 of the podcast. But we haven't actually really had a a dedicated Forex person on on the podcast yet. And I guess maybe that's because most of my network is in the equities and equity derivative space. But it's going to be good to speak to you, Ian. Welcome to Talking With Traders. Thanks, Garth. Nice to be here. Nice yeah. to see you again. Yeah, and you. Likewise. Thanks. Yeah, so we met at the London Trader Show last week, or uh, well, the week before last, and um, had a chat about what you guys were doing there at FX Street and decided it'd be a good idea to get you on the podcast and talk a little bit about you know yourself, your experience in the markets, and also just to touch a little bit up on on what FX Street does. Um, but as I always do with new guests on this podcast, I like to just get a little bit of background to your story. Uh, you know, you I can clearly see you've got some gray hairs, but like me, getting some gray hairs. So you've <laughs> you've got some scars. I'm sure you've been around yeah. the block a bit. Um, tell us about your career in the market, and you know, the, briefly the path that you've taken to get to where you are now. Okay. I'm going to let you guys do the maths, but I I started um, in foreign exchange markets, if you like it, when I was 18 years of age. Um, I'm now 54. So, um, yeah, if you cut me in half, it will probably say FX somewhere, um, (laughs) like a stick of Brighton Rock. But um, did I gain sort of experience for for trading back in the day? No, probably not. Um, I was an FX broker. Um, so we were the guys uh, basically back in the day that used to put trades together between banks. Um, I worked on a desk at uh, a company called God to, God to Lashley and Pierce. Uh, it was based on Cannon Street in London. Um, and we uh, used to broke um, dollar Swiss, so forward dollar Swiss. So not the spot market, not what most retail traders trade. Um, we were putting um, trades together by the, you know, through the likes of sort of UBS, um, NatWest, um, Citibank, uh, mo- mainly the big sort of players, uh, global players in in foreign exchange at the time. Um, and we were middlemen, so we would somebody would want to do a six month swap. We would try and get them the best rate. They'd check names to see if they could do each other, believe it or not, because some bankers couldn't lend to each other or, or receive. Um, and then the deal will be done and we would get paid brokerage for it. Um, so that sort of was my, I'm going to say a baptism of fire because it, it definitely was. Uh, I'd come from a very short banking uh, background. I worked at Midland Bank, which is now HSBC, yeah. um, doing the Prudential book um, in uh, Canada Street, not Canada Street, sorry, uh, up in Holborn. And I got, um, I used to go out drinking with these uh, brokers because uh, one of my pals worked worked there and um it was a case of what you sorry who you knew not what you knew back in the day i right. mean now you need sort of degrees and stuff like that but um i was lucky enough to go get, get off in a position um and went through the ranks pretty quickly uh so started off at god's lashley and pierce 
moved to another company called uh, Babcock Fulton Prebon. That then became Prebon Imani. Um, always broke in dollar Swiss. Then I went to broke dollar yen. Uh, then I went back to dollar Swiss. Went to a company called RP Martins, um, and set set up my own desk there. Um, broke in dollar Swiss. I was quite young at the time, um, and yeah, gained a lot of experience about the functionality of foreign exchange, if you like. But you know, were we deciphering charts and um, were we sort of trying to work order flow and uh, and stuff like that? No, we weren't. We were, you know, two two phones, and and you, and you ground out the uh, the, the trade. So um, I left uh, the markets at thirty six voluntarily. I'd like to say because okay. a lot of uh, a lot of people were a lot of desks desks were closing down at the time. The right. competition was fierce. Um, a lot of the brokers were in competition with each other. Well, all the brokers were in competition with each other, and they were offering discount rates to to banks to try and gain their business. And then one broker would undercut another broker, and the you know our pool where we got paid from was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and they bought in uh, a um, wage system called PRP, which is profit related pay. Right. And uh, it was everything to sort of cut down. Um, the, the middlemen basically and EBS came in which was the electronic banking system so you know as with AI now I suppose you know these sort of computers and computer programs started to take our jobs so right. I decided it was time to get out um, I actually came back to Sheffield uh, where I grew up as a kid I married a, a, a young lady at the time from Sheffield okay. um, and we set up a delicatessen coffee shop um, that was more hard work than than broken. <laughs> well, I thought I was going in the other direction, but I wasn't. Um, seven days a week, yeah. uh, even even earlier mornings. Um, so um, I got got offered the opportunity uh, from a company uh, that white labelled um, a spread betting platform um, while I still had the deli. So I sold that and went to work for them, uh, basically producing analysis for them. Okay. Um, that was about. God, how many years ago now? Must be 20 years. Uh, so I was only out of the market a small period of time, if you like. Right. And then jumped back in and really did jump back, back in uh, with a lot of force um, and um, committed myself to sort of really understand what bank traders were doing, um, okay. and what technical analysis was all about, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, I then went on to... Right, quite a lot of reports for FX Street at the time. Um, got headhunted by a company called PIA, which was um, Price Information Advantage, it was called, which predominantly dealt with banks and gave analysis to banks. Uh, wrote analysis for that company. And then myself and a colleague, uh, Steve O'Hare, we ended up um, buying the business, if you like. Um, yeah. Turned it into a retail offering instead of being a an institutional offering, so sold it into the likes of platforms like IG Index, uh, Saxo mm. Bank, etc. Right. Um, and then uh, left that company, but still worked for that company, believe it or not. Um, mm. Bit of a weird story there. Um, a few years ago, and have started working for FX Street. So okay. myself and um, four other uh, colleagues uh, run the premium service around there. So right. it's a Discord channel writing uh analysis deciphering the news uh we've got live coverage tonight obviously with the fed yep so we've got a live coverage channel uh and trade plans so it's educational it's informative um and hopefully uh profitable yes um, so yeah okay it's, so well, that's that my journey Okay, yeah. very good, very good. Okay, so so forex. I mean, I've always had it in my mind that, and, and I've not done a lot of forex trading, you know, because I've got more of an equities background. But sure. it, being a trader, I suppose we all dabble in different things here and there. And of course, forex is an enormous market. Uh, but I've always sort of had it in my mind that trading forex is harder than trading equities or equity indices because you're looking for a much smaller percentage move usually, which means you have to take far bigger positions to really move the needle when trading Forex. Okay. Now, I don't know. I mean, do you agree with that line of thinking or, um, or have I got it wrong? Now, they're obviously very different products. 
but at the end of yeah. the day as well, like, you know, you say you look at technical analysis, a, a chart's a chart, you know, it's, uh, the, the, the patterns are similar, they're repeatable in, in different markets. Um, yeah. I don't know, am I on the mark there or is that not fair to say that? I, th the... I think there's pros and cons for both. Um, I think um, there's more advantages advantages for trading foreign exchange than disadvantages. So you've got high liquidity. Yeah. Um, you've got um, 24 hour coverage. Yep. Um, you've um, got. Um, I, I, I think I think the the beauty of foreign exchange is getting away from indices, but single stocks I just find too difficult to analyze. Okay. To, to be perfectly honest, when right. I first got out of the markets, I I I, I delved into the single stocks, um, and you know, working out a company's background um, and in and, and share price. And it, it was too complicated for me, to be honest. Okay. Um, and I needed something that was far more systematic um, and hence chart analysis. And hence why I went and got a diploma from the Society of Technical Analysts, because I'm obsessed with charts, basically. Right. Um, and what I like about foreign exchange is that you've got or i've got 47 different products to look at um so you know if you i think with retail traders especially if you're sort of talking to to somebody that's just started on their journey and you say you know what products do you do you like to trade and i know this from the from the discord channel yeah because it's there's one product that we get asked probably 30 times a day and every all retail is just obsessed with gold Okay. Um, so it's, you know, what's the price on gold? What's the price on gold? It, it moves a dollar and we're getting asked them, what would happen tonight with, with gold, you know, with the Fed meeting, blah, blah. And it's, you know, and I think it's some people that start on the journey just sit around and say, right, I'm going to just concentrate on one one major. I'm just going yeah. to look at euro against the US dollar. Yeah. Or I quite like the way that sterling dollar moves. So I'm going to concentrate on that. But they miss so many opportunities in, 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 other, in other products. Um, I scan the markets, I, 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 con, not continuously, but I always know when I'm getting a setup and I look at um, single currencies to forecast weakness against strength. So I'm always looking for one weak currency against one strong currency. Yeah. Now, sometimes I'll be lucky enough that I will get um, risk currencies that all line up saying you know you should be buying risk and then i can look at the uh, at stock indices because i want to be buying risk okay but i'm always looking at correlation so everything i believe that the market's just one big matrix yeah and you need to be looking at you know do you want to sell sterling which products are telling you to sell sterling is euro sterling looking to go, go higher to sterling swiss look look looks looks bearish to sterling and you're bearish then you've got the correlation for sterling i think when you're just looking at purely a single product or or or, or, or stock indices i i personally struggle to get that correlation the right. chart formations still work um and my system will occasionally work but i don't i don't feel that they're as strong if you if, if put it that way right because i haven't got that i'm always looking for an overlay i'm careful of of analysis paralysis as they mm. say where you've yeah. got millions of indicators on a chart and you can't pull the trigger because you know it's just too confusing yeah um and um and because of that i i i sort of I just focus on FX. Okay. All right. That's really interesting. So 47 products, obviously 47 currency pairs, but you did mention yeah. gold. So, I mean, are there a couple of things outside of just foreign Forex pairs there, something like gold? Do you, do you look at other commodities at all? Uh, gold, that? US crude. Okay. Um, I look at Brent. All right. Uh, I analyze them all. I don't right. trade them personally. Yeah. Um, okay. And then obviously um, all the uh, US indices, the DAX, FTSE. Yeah. Um, Etc. But okay. And and your style of trading? Are you a, a day trader or are you more of a swing trader? I mean, what's the sort of average holding no. time frame for for, your, for a trade in your world? Definitely swing. Swing. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I've I do believe that you know, not there's no one size fits all. 
you know, the, if you you can scout the markets uh, and be, you know, an aggressive day trader that does 40 trades a day, etc. Yes. Um, when I first sort of started off on my journey, I, I, I sort of, I tried this. Um, it didn't work for me. Yeah. Um, and I do believe that sort of over time, you do develop your own approach to the market. Um, I've got a pal called Lee, who we used to work with, um, and he trades 15 minutes in the morning for the DAX, DAX oh. Open, and he trades 15 minutes in the afternoon for the S&P Open. Really? And, you know, but he's still there, he's still analysing the markets, but yeah. they're the sort of, you know, they're the, they're, they're, there is two focal, focus points is when the markets, uh, markets open. Okay. Um, my setups, I think you've also got to have a system. Okay. Yeah. News moves markets. We, 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 we know that the Fed yeah. interest rate decision t tonight will move a mark markets. Um, the BOJ meeting on Tuesday morning, which completely, um, hoodwinked me to be honest, because yeah. I was convinced it was going to go in the other direction. Yeah. Um, for the benefit know, that... of the listeners, we, we're recording this on the 20th of March, by the way. So it's the, the Fed meeting tonight on Wednesday, the 20th of March. And then obviously the Bank of Japan meeting you're, you're referring to was yesterday morning where they, yeah. um, the Bank of Japan have now announced much anticipated that they are raising, they're starting to raise interest rates and they're dialing back this um, easy monetary policy that's been in place for, for what feels like forever. Um, and yeah, I, I think a lot of a lot of people, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of people, <laughs> I, 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 exactly. Yeah. I mean, a lot of what I read, you know, everybody said, well, you know, now that interest rates are going to start to move up in Japan, money's going to flow out of the rest of the world back into Japan, and you're going to find the yen getting stronger. Or, well, as you say, it did completely the opposite yeah. of that. In fact, the yen moved quite sharply weaker yesterday after that. And yeah. you know, what what was the reason? Just be, by the way, I mean, what, was it because the I move in it's... interest rates wasn't as big as what people thought it might be? Yeah, I think so. And maybe a bit of sort of buy the rumor, sell the fact yeah. scenario. I mean, um, I look like I said before. I look at single uh, currency baskets. I'd I'd bought a pattern, you know, um, a few weeks ago which worked really well. And I had everything lined up for a continuation to the other side. Yeah. So it completely wrong footed me. Um, and, you know, I do take a lot of notice of data releases, um, you know, speeches, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just, it, it, it completely wrong footed me. So mm. I'm surprised the market's taking it. So taking the yen so low, um, you've got a uh, wage inflation, which was a you know massive concern in uh, in in Japan, and they actually said that if it got up to five and a half percent, that you know um, they would have to start the, the hiking cycle, yeah. and it's up up around those levels. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. Um, I, I, I wish I did. Otherwise, yeah. I wouldn't have been caught well, on the wrong side. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I mean, sure. markets markets always yeah. have a way of surprising us, don't they? Or doing the least yeah. obvious thing. Yeah. Um, but to, to that point, I mean, you're talking about risk uh, and when things do go wrong. How, how do you manage risk on a trade? And what, what, what you know, like a lot of, and again, I'm going to go back to the retail um, derivative der, um, stock and derivatives uh, trading market here. But, you know, there's this, the notion you risk 1% of your capital on a trade and all of that sort of thing. Now, in your world, how do you manage risk? How do you define position size and, and, and manage okay. risks? Well, I think the issue is, and the issue is with most retail traders um, and, and, and myself included, is that if you risk 1% of your capital, you're never going to make enough money. Okay. Um, you know, I think the average retail trader from my experience has got something in the region of two and a half thousand to three thousand pound in, in an account. Um, yeah. You know, you're going to be trading micro lots if mm. you're if you're if, if you're risking one percent um if you're risking one percent and you're doing 40 trades a day then that's um understandable um okay. but my setups are you have to be patient you know i might get one two three a week if i'm lucky okay so again if i'm risking one percent and i'm looking at a sort of four to one risk reward ratio and I get them all right, that'd be great. Then I've got, you know, I've got, I've got twelve percent on on the week, but yeah. they won't all all play out. So, yeah. you know, I I look if I if I like the setup, 
um, I'm far more likely to risk in the region of sort of four or five percent. Um, I always know my entry level. Um, I always know my stop. Yeah. And I always know my target um, before I'm executing any trade. Um, sometimes I can get in the region of, you know, six to seven um, R, which is risking against reward yeah. um, on, on some of my setups. So if I get a bleeder like that, um, then, you know, it can make my my week, my month. Yeah. It, and it takes, takes care of a lot of losses as well. Yeah. 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 Um, you, you, you refer to setups quite a bit and i know um, before the podcast we said you know you asked me could we share screen and all that so because this is a podcast we don't usually do that but um at the same time we're, we're noticing that a large part of our audience is actually consuming these podcasts through youtube now uh so we're going to try the share screen thing now and uh, and give you the opportunity to actually share a couple of setups because it is potentially more you know easier to explain it visually so yeah. you know for for the benefit of um of those who are watching this podcast on youtube you'll be able to see what we're talking about if you're listening to the podcast on a on a podcast app well then obviously you're going to just have to listen extra carefully to try and imagine what we're saying mm -hmm. or maybe come back and watch the youtube video afterwards but Ian, let's uh, you i've enabled you to to share screen if you'd like sure. to uh, yeah sure create a, a show show us what a what a setup looks like in your world okay well i i had an old boss that used to say that if you wrote a report an fx report like a, a, a trade signal or a trade plan that the uh, the reader should be able to close their eyes and imagine what's going on so yeah. hopefully uh, we'll be able to we'll be able to do that um when we uh, when we show this so there's two setups that i've looked at um this morning um one is for Sterling, New Zealand. Okay, and I just I can't see I can't see your yeah, screen just by the way. Um, just in case I, I didn't know, thought maybe you're on another screen and 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 you know how it is. We all have multiple screens as traders. Sometimes we should end up wrong. sharing the wrong screen. Right yeah, I can see that. So what have we got there? New Zealand uh, yeah. retail that's sales, it. UK retail sales. Yeah, that's the right. Sterling, New Zealand. So I'm actually going to drop okay. it off to um to, to the Sterling Swiss. So the you were talking about sort of what products to a trade. So this right hand side, it's basically all the products that I look at. So there's a there's a fair bit to go at. Um, every time there's a an amber um, dash, if you like, next to a product, it's something that I'm considering. Um, okay. When there's when there's a red, it's something that I've sold. Um, so sterling Swiss should be red as well, um, and. Obviously, when it's blue, it's something that I've bought. So you can see on there, there's there's something like 65 products um, right. that with 45 being FX. So what I do look at is I, I used to be fanatical about uh, Fibonacci levels, so okay. Fib levels. Um, I, back in the day, um, I was a uh, Elliott Wave enthusiast, should we say? Um, but I found it too subjective. Um, I always like breaking down time frames from higher to lower um, time frames. So looking at a weekly chart daily, mm -hmm. uh, eight hour, four hour. And, you know, you used to talk to different people about a single product and they'll say, oh, yeah, we're in the fourth wave in a five wave count on the weekly chart. But then you'll see it correcting lower and then they would adjust the analysis to sort of curve fit, if you like, what uh, what was actually ha happening in the product. So, yeah. I, so I sort of fell out of love with um, Elliott Wave. I still use it to a certain extent, but only if it's inside these other patterns. Um, so I then read a book, um, and I read a hell of a lot of books. Um, I think education is key. Um, I read a book called Trade What You See, yeah. um, and it's about um, cipher patterns, um, symmetrical patterns, which are also based um, around... Um, fib levels so fib extension levels fib retracement levels and i found that when you actually pinpointed uh, the completion of these patterns that they offered really good um trade opportunities um so there's four 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 major patterns there's a, a crab a butterfly uh, a gartley 
and I'm going to fit in a bat formation. I okay. forgot the last one. <laughs> okay. um, two are inside patterns, two are outside patterns. Right. Um, obviously, if you want to get more in depth with, with the actual formations, then I suggest you read that book. Okay. Um, and basically what I, uh, I, I've always also managed to do is I managed, and this is about 15 years ago, I actually um, paid a, a, a Russian developer to um, program a, a system for me that highlights areas of support and resistance, and that's I wouldn't call it a USP because I'm not I'm, I'm not selling anything, but that's sort of my unique uh, analytical tool that I use, and that that's actually the dashed lines on the charts. Okay. Um, and I look to those dashed lines um, for support and resistance, and for the completion of these these cipher formations. So what I want to do if i'm looking at a cross currency or any currency i want to have a good thesis for one currency to go lower and one currency to go higher and that can be um technical and fundamental or it can just be technical so as we said earlier news drives markets um so you know if you're looking at a reversal of a decent trend why is it going to reverse? Well, I've got a technical level. Yeah, but why? why? What's going to drive it? So you can actually see on the chart at the moment, I've got New Zealand retail sales. So that yeah. actually comes out today. So, you know, from this topping formation or potential topping formation, there's a driver, there's, there's New Zealand retail sales, which could drive the New Zealand dollar higher. Um, we'll stick to this one actually instead of... So, so yeah, just so that we... I know, so we're looking at the pound versus the New Zealand dollar, yeah? Yeah. And what is so, the time frame on this chart? This 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 um, chart is actually six hours. Six hours, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, only because it's easier to see. So I actually formulated on a on a four hour chart. Right. So the cipher pattern completes at two ten seventy. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we've got New Zealand retail sales, like I said, that could be the catalyst for lower sterling, higher New Zealand, and then on um, the twenty second. Uh, which is obviously Friday. Yep. We've got UK, UK retail sales. So again, that could be another driver uh, for this um, currency cross. But I've mentioned single currency, single currencies a lot. So I'm going to show you the single currency baskets that I've developed. Now, uh, I use TradingView charts. Okay. Um, and basically every single currency basket that I've developed is a combination of, of, of crosses. So in other words, I look at eight different um, single currencies. So the sterling single currency basket is seven different sterling crosses overlaid on top of each other. Okay. Sterling Aussie, sterling Swiss, euro sterling, sterling yen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The only one that I don't combine myself, or the only two actually, uh, is the yen basket, which is already done for you. Um, and DXY, which is obviously the dollar basket, so, yes. um, yeah. which obviously is a weighted basket. So right. what I'm looking for, I'm looking for a news driver, which we've already talked about. But then I'm also looking for a chart formation that tells me that I should be selling sterling. So, I, so I've got my sterling New Zealand sell signal. I now right. want a chart formation that tells me that I should be selling, selling sterling. And I also want a chart formation that tells me I should be buying New Zealand. So if we go and look at this chart, this is the weekly chart um, for the sterling basket. Um, we had a decent sell-off when um, the UK went into a technical recession and we've seen this quite aggressive move back to the upside. Yeah. Now, this area here, which is near the previous swing high, that's a prime short entry for the CD leg in this single currency basket. Yeah. And I like it because it's telling me that the risk is limited because it's near the previous swing high. I know that if it breaks that swing high, then this pattern is none and void. It's gone. Yeah. It's disappeared. Yeah. So really to short sterling here, you've got that as your potential return, which yeah. is just for the um, people that can't see the screen. So in this single currency basket, you're looking at, you know, a decent percentage 
Yeah. I don't believe that's a true percentage of sterling. It's but, a big move, though. I can see yeah. that. And yeah. then, you know, so if we put, let's put a risk, um, a risk reward calculator on there. So basically, you know, you'll be looking at uh, a risk reward of maybe 8, 8R, eight yeah. maybe 9R. Okay. So you're trying to sell at the top of what I believe is a potential trend. Then if I go to New Zealand, obviously, if I'm selling sterling, I want to be buying New Zealand. I go to New Zealand and I need a chart to tell me that I could go in the opposite direction. So this is the daily chart on New Zealand. This is what's known as what I call a projected support level because this area here will make a bat formation. So I'm looking for a move to the upside in this BC leg. So I'm basically looking for Sterling to go lower after completing the BC leg, yeah. and I'm looking for New Zealand to move higher within the BC leg. Okay. So I've got those, I've got that correlation. I've got, I've got one moving in one direction. I've got one moving in the other direction. And these levels, what you'll find is these levels will, will line up. So you, it, it won't be exact, but if you go and look at other sterling crosses, Predominantly, out of the other seven sterling crosses that you've got that you're looking at, most of them should be telling you to sell sterling. So the sterling New Zealand setup, we've also got a sterling uh, Swiss sell setup. Like I said, there was there was two two trades that I've been uh, been focusing on with regards to selling sterling. But then sterling dollar is in a downward path at the moment, downward trajectory. I, mm -hmm. I, I think we're moving lower in an Elliott wave count. I know I said I wasn't fanatical about it, but I still, mm -hmm. I still look at it. And the other Sterling crosses all look like there's scope for Sterling to move lower. Okay, they're not okay. signals, but they've all got scope for to, to, to move lower. So it's basically using correlation. Um, it's using single currency baskets to highlight a strong and a weak currency and then it's using chart formations to basically turn around and say, yeah, you could be having a top here. And and, yeah. and that uh, offers a decent um, trading opportunity. And if we go back to uh, this sterling New Zealand, just uh, very quickly. Yes. So, you know, the, the, the topping formation or the completion of the pattern is at 2.10.70. Uh, we've made a 2.10.66 swing high at right. the moment. I'm not saying it's not going to get there. Um, mm. But then... Again, um, going back to Sterling New Zealand, you've got to have a target level. So the eight-hour chart highlights that I will complete a pattern going in the other direction at 20460-ish. So it gives me an entry. And as I was saying before, a lot of retail traders don't realize the importance of having a defined entry, a defined stop, and a defined target. Mm. So this will give me a defined target. It's given me a defined entry, and then I can work out my my risk. And you know, I was saying to you before, you know, sometimes I'll get a decent sort of bleeder, what, what I like to call a bleeder, which, which where you know the news drives this this cross aggressively, yeah. and um, I can manage it quite quickly, so I can get in at a, what I think is a prime level, I can get a stop loss to entry because basically, if that isn't the high, then all these patterns just fall out of bed, if you like. Yeah. Um, and that enables me to get quite a decent risk reward setup. And you can see on here, you know, if I had a stop loss of seventy odd ticks, it's yeah. nearly eight and a half R. So yeah. I don't need very many of these to fall into place to, yeah. to to make money yeah the only yeah. the only issue that i have uh the only issue that a, a lot of sort of um traders on the discord channel um talk about is obviously the um the rolling costs um i'm not in and out um of of, of trades as we said earlier you know i'm, yeah. I'm, I'm swing trading so sometimes yeah. the rolling cost can be quite expensive that's the funding cost, right? The, yeah. the difference yeah. between the, the different currency pairs, because obviously yeah. you're pairing off one country's yeah. interest rates against another. And occasionally you get paid, but it, it never yeah. seems to be in my favor. <laughs> 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 Strangely enough.
All right. Okay. So that's interesting. Just on that chart, I mean, last thing before we we leave the screen, um, you know, what would what would trigger the entry here? Because you know, you've you've identified it, what I would call, I suppose, an area of interest where you're going to be looking to potentially the, the, put this trade on. But what has to happen for the trade to actually be initiated? I don't wait for um, a reversal candle formation. Okay. I used to look at um, what what I used to call outside bars, and I mm. used to use DMARC indicators. Yeah. To highlight a flip, so uh, there's a four candle. Um, reversal formation in 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 d mark and if i got one of these reversal candles and then i got a one count um i would use that as my initiation candle and i'd place my stop loss above it okay um, the reason that i sort of fell out of love with that to a certain extent was because you know i might have to wait for a six hour candle mm. to 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 produce a sell signal and by that point you know using this sort of um currency cross as an example that could be 50 points lower yeah you know my stop loss original stop loss if i just hit the trigger um might have only been 30 40 points so right. i'm suddenly massively extending my stop loss because my entry mm -hmm. is so much bigger um so what i have a tendency to do is um i look at i still look at dmark indicators and i look for a 13 count which is an exhaustion count um, I look at it hopefully in a higher time frame. So when I say a higher time frame, I'm not looking down into what I call micro charts. I don't, mm. I'm not interested in one minute and two minute and five minute charts. What I'd like to see is a, is a 13 count, maybe on an hourly chart, two hour, three hour, four hour, eight hour daily. Um, and then I calculate my stop loss from there. Um, okay. So the completion of the pattern, which in this case is 21070, is the entry. I'll then look at a D mark 13 uh, to calculate a stop. And those that don't know how to calculate a stop from a D mark 13, um, you basically look at the length of the candle that has produced the 13 count. You then add the length of that candle, if it's a sell trade, on top of your trigger candle. And that's your defined stop loss. Okay. All right. So so again, you know, if 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 that candle is quite small then your defined stop can be quite small. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't run away from that um, because that defined stop being quite small will um, will result in a, in a in a bigger R rate, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, super. All right, brilliant. And well, let's let's um, stop the sh the screen share there yeah. and and then carry on. Um, I mean, we are getting towards the end of our lots of time anyway. But I've just got one or two more things I'd like to quickly ask you. Um, I mean, in terms of a daily routine. Do you have a specific routine that you follow as a trader yeah. getting set up for the market for the day ahead? Yeah. Um, I, I don't trade opens and, 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 you know, the open and close. Um, I, I, because I swing trade and I scan the markets quite regularly, um, out of boredom probably about six times a day, which I could probably do <laughs> twice a day and, right. and, and still, and still find my setups. Um, but I I I start work quite early. Um, my alarm goes off about half past five. I normally wake up before that, about half past. Sorry, sorry my alarm goes off at ten to six. I normally get up about half past five before the alarm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sat in front of screens by um, ten to six. Um, scanning the markets. I write um, some reports for uh, Signal Center uh, okay. for the first sort of 30, 40 minutes of my day, uh, yeah. which gets me focused on what's moving, what the news is. Yeah. Um, I have uh, just two screens. Uh, I've got multiple screens everywhere, but just two screens. And for one of my first jobs in the morning is to look at the news feeds that I that I follow. Right. Uh, so I have News Squawk on there, um, Reuters, um, obviously FX Street news feed. Um, I have um, an oil platform on there that tells me what's moving commodities. I'll scan that to see if there's any breaking news stories that I should be aware of. Um, I then will look at the calendar. What I normally do on the single currency basket, as, as you could see previously, mm. I will note when there's data releases coming out. Yeah. So, you know, on DXY, I've got a big horizontal line uh, at uh, this evening's release. Yeah. Say, you know, Fed interest rate decision. Um mm. You know, yesterday it was BOJ. So I know when these um, when these 
reports are, are, are due out. But on a Sunday or a Monday morning, that will be one of my tasks, just to highlight all the different important data releases, Fed yeah. speakers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and then at uh, 7 o'clock or about quarter to 7, uh, I start getting ready for the day with um, the FX Street uh, Discord channel. Okay. So that is, again, writing um, reports on the, what we call the seven major products. Yeah. Um, and then I, I have a tendency, because it's sort of my background, to write a report, but then have an intraday set up on it. So, you know, I'll, with, a, with a good focus on single currency baskets, but also with a good focus on risk reward. Yeah. So if I can't see an intraday setup, then I won't, I, I won't post it. But, you know, this morning was um, selling Euro dollar on a Euro dollar on a rally, uh, focusing on a certain level, you know, a three to one sort of risk reward uh, setup. Mm. By, by about quarter, quarter past seven, a half past seven, we've done those reports. And then it's a case of just working through the day, um, We've got a lot of traders in the Discord channel that are looking at a, a variety of different products, uh, including single stocks. Um, you know, we 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 will write analytical reports okay. on the single stocks. Not really, not not too much on the fundamental side. Right. Um, my colleagues um, are some are technical, te technically focused. Some are more fundamental. So it's quite a good combination of, of of traders um you know a lot of um the people within the discord channel will say what's sterling swiss and i'll give an analytical view and they go can you can somebody write me a fundamental report on that what's driving sterling what's driving swiss so you right. get a combination of everything okay um i finish i finish work at about half past three because uh, okay. i start quite early um I, I have an afternoon off um every once a week where i play golf Okay. Um, nice. I have a slightly addictive personality, so I have to sit in front of these charts and get focused. But I'm also um, pretty obsessed with golf. I think it's a bit like trading. You know, if you're not on your game, um, you can you can have a bad round. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you can see the shots and you know where it's going to go and you can read the parts and stuff like mm. that. Sometimes mm. you stand over the ball and you just haven't got a clue. So yeah. No, um, there's and, lots of parallels. Yeah, between yeah. various sports. Also yeah. think like in golf, it's, you know, it's about stringing your good shots together and yeah. in trading as well, you know, yeah, anyone can hit yeah. a good golf shot once, but can you do it, you know, 60 times in a row? Well, that's where <laughs> I struggle. Yeah, well, me too. <laughs> yeah. And that's trading true. likewise, you know, can you have 60 good trades in a row? It doesn't mean they're all winners, but are they good trades? Yeah. So, you know, consistency. Yeah. There's a story there, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to bore you with that one. <laughs> All right, Ian. And last thing before we wrap it up, in any books, you did say that you're quite a prolific reader. Um, yeah. If you were I mean, to name, got... name like one or two books that you think I've... a potential Forex trader should absolutely read, what are they? I've always got books on my desk. Um, I've recently moved house. So there's quite a lot still in, in storage, but th mm. I've got a notebook. I know everybody gets told to keep a diary. I do write in it every day. Yeah. Um, I print off every report that i take it will be the, the sort of you know the base currency cross with the single currencies and 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 my reason behind it makes that 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 ensures that i'm not going off track that i'm sticking yeah. to my to my system um and then this is a book that i've recently oh yes uh, read did you, did you see Steve? I, the, yeah the, i did i, I, I don't show. have it on my desk but I, yeah. because I, it's actually next to my bed that's where it is yeah. but um I, so, it's stephen goldstein's book the mental mastering the mental game of trading so yeah. likewise i'm i am reading it at the moment and i actually had stephen on the podcast to about three weeks ago yeah so great yeah, he's guy. a great guy he used to work at credit swiss yes when i was broken so yeah. um yeah. so it was sort of a, a name from the past if you like yeah yeah. And the other one I'm reading is, at the moment is this one. The Wick Wick off. Wick off. Okay. Um, um, I, I have a tendency to read everything and maybe throw away 95% apart from the psychology side mm, <laughs> that, mm, that mm. I really do uh, take to heart. Yeah. But I find that um, this system might work, but will it work for me? Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's the thing, you know, um, a lot there's a lot of focus at the moment on smart money concept 
um, you know, to, to our institution. I know you're going to ask me about institutional um, establishments uh, earlier on, you know, mm. being involved in the foreign exchange market, you know, and, and there seems to be a lot of not conspiracy theories, but the, the, there's a lot of theories that, you know, these guys gang up and go and hunt stop losses and, and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, in my experience from sort of back in the day, I, I don't think it happened. Um, okay. Whether or not that's that's changed. Um, I find I find some of the concept interesting. I find I f find the break of highs and lows quite interesting and potential liquidity grabs. Um, but it doesn't really fit into my format, if you like. Okay. All right. Super. All right, Ian. Well, we've run out of time, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, but thank you very much for for making yourself available for this interview. It's been great chatting to you and getting a bit of insight into the forex market and into the way you trade and how you see things. Uh, it is quite different, I must say, to the way um, we look at equity markets and analyze stocks. So, pretty interesting. But thank you again for your time. Uh, I appreciate it, and hopefully, we we meet up again at some stage soon. That's great. Thanks, Garth. Appreciate right. appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking With Traders, brought to you by IG, a world-leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.